Ladies, what is going on with your money? Are you feeling anxious or pumped about your money? Confused about what's going on with Reddit and GameStop? Do you have a plan for this month? Or you're just kind of flying by the seat of your pants? And how about work? When you go to work, do you have a case of the Mondays every single day? Or are you so excited to get your career going? Hey, I'm Katie Heyer, and I am your guide helping you to avoid the financial mistakes I made and to make much better, <laughs> much better decisions in your money so you can be a rock star with money. By the way, if you need some help with budgeting or getting started, stopping the paycheck to paycheck lifestyle, I am here to help you. Just shoot me a DM. By the way, I am speaking at the upcoming Smart and Frugal Moms conference. It's online. I'll be presenting on what you need to do when you need a miracle in your money. And I will link that conference in the show notes. Don't miss it. If you need it, it's going to be fantastic. And I can't wait. So I hope to see you there. Please join me. Now, last episode, I promised we would talk a little bit about the stock market because GameStop, Reddit, there's a whole bunch of attention being paid to the stock market right now. And I know the stock market is a little confusing topic for a lot of us. So <clears throat> time to demystify. What is the stock market? Do you know? I would love to hear what your impressions are, your anxieties are, your fears, or your confidence. I want to know how you're feeling when you think about putting your wealth building, your retirement investments in the stock market. How does that make you feel? Well, if you go back 400 years and look at the first global traders, we're thinking back to our third grade history books, our <clears throat> favorite Dutch East India trading company, right? You can see the buckles on the shoes and imagine what I'm talking about. Well, it was very expensive to sail a ship across the globe. So the Dutch East India trading company said, hey, if you pay for us to get there, I will share some of my profits with you. In fact, I will make it a contract. So you fork over the cash and I will give you this signed contract share a share you will share in the profits and so you could pay for a little piece of the dutch east india trading company to take their voyage across the globe and to go come back with spices and everybody loved spices so you thought hmm i bet you'll make money coming back so if i invest in your company and you give me a share of the profits I might make a return on my investment. Now, the Dutch East India Trading Company was just one of the many trading companies you could buy a share of. You could think of them as the first stock. Okay, so the stock is the company, the share is the piece of it. That was the world's first example of the stock market. And it would happen in real life, in person. People. People would stand on this bridge and say, who are you and who do you have a share in? Do you want to, oh, I heard some good news about that boat, that ship that they're taking. I heard they upgraded their sails. So, hmm, but they're going to get there faster, but they're coming back faster. That means faster profits. So I will sell you my share, but it's going to it's going to cost you twice as much as I bought it for, but that's still a good deal. Okay. So then you could trade your shares that is a very simplified third grade version of what goes on in the stock market. And it's a market, just like a supermarket has a lot of different choices you can pick from. You can pick junk food, you can pick whole foods, you can pick processed foods, you can pick stuff that is a terrible buy, you can buy in bulk and get a good price per ounce. Just like the supermarket, you have to go through the sales, you got to pay attention to prices, you got to pay attention to all the details when you do your shopping. Well, the stock market is like that too. There are crummy, crummy funds on there. There are great stocks. You just have to pay attention. So the stock market is not 
good or bad in and of itself. It's just like the supermarket. You can interact with it, figure out what is a good buy, what is not, what to stay away from, what to invest in. And so this little explanation is my <clears throat> my attempt, my hope that you start to feel a little more confident about what is the stock market? How do I even understand what's going on? All these Wall Street traders kind of intimidate me. I've heard people talk about that. So that's what the first stock market 101 lesson here at the Katie Hire Show is. Does that make sense? DM me, leave me a comment below. Tell me, I think you need to go over that again. Or tell me, oh, I passed third grade. I got it. Let's move on. Now, if you've been tracking with me here on the show, you know that I like to focus on the biblical standard for the example of who we should be looking to for how to treat our money. What should we what should we be doing in this whole world of finances? Jesus. Okay, yes, Jesus does say a lot about money, but no, in this show, I have been tracking along with the Proverbs 31 woman. So what advice, what it what Wisdom has she for us today. Proverbs 31, 19 reads, In her hand she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. Okay, how am I going to turn a distaff and a spindle into some good, actionable takeaway content for us to gain from and use today. I have a great idea. And first it starts with, what is a distaff? And what is a spindle? Okay, let's say you are a shepherd and you shear your sheep and you have a pile of wool and you are going to turn that into thread. So you have a lovely, a lovely sweater later a lovely tunic later. Well, in one hand, you have a ream of unprocessed wool around a long rod. This is your raw material. And when you pull it, little fibers come out little by little, and you can spin them together and slowly make a thread by hand. The spindle is a smaller rod weighted down with a little rock or just a heavier end of the stick and you can spin it itself and it will hang from the recently created thread you just made and then as you pull more wool from your distaff you can spin it more and turn it into more and more thread. And yes, I did go down the rabbit hole on YouTube looking at all these <laughs> people who dress up in uh, accurate period clothing and teach all about distaffs and spindles. And so I've learned about Scottish spindles and Norwegian spindles and all sorts of different distaff techniques. Okay, but how does that translate to us talking about money? How does that work? Well, if you have one thing a mess of wool that you can do nothing with in its current form. And you want a beautiful scarf or a lovely comforter or the pillow cover that you need. How do you get from that was just on a sheep to, oh, I love this scarf. How do you get from there to there? That is what our lovely lady with the spindle and distaff can teach us little by little, little decisions made with intentionality and foresight will help us go from a mess, living paycheck to paycheck, for example, or feeling like we're on the brink of bankruptcy or being in a brittle marriage where every time money comes up, it's an explosive fight. Well, you can go from that unusable thing, that pile of unusable wool, you can go from that to an incredible tapestry, little by little. That is what this verse is all about to me. When I read it, it's about intentionality because 
it just doesn't happen by accident. You don't just snap your fingers and the wool magically turns into thread. No, you have to take time out of your day to do the work of the spinning. And in this, I have a little picture if you're following along on YouTube. In this <clears throat> Bouvier painting of a young girl and a distaff and a spindle, you can see the rod that the thread gets transferred to is only 8, 10, 12 inches long. You can carry this stuff around with you as you're doing your regular chores back in ancient Israel's days, back in Bible times, right? It's portable, so you can take care of all the household needs. You can go to market. You can go do your trading. You can come back home and work a little more on it. That's like our financial life. We can't set it and forget it. There's a little bit, a little decision that has to be made every day. The decision that I'm not going through McDonald's this morning for takeout breakfast. The decision that I'm not ordering lunch to work today. The decision that I'm going to budget for this month. I'm going to make a plan for what I'm going to do with all my income this month. And I'm going to make my income work for me. Every day we face decisions that will make an impact on our finances. And the decisions that you make, the little ones, day by day. Am I going to look at my 401k? Am I going to enroll in the retirement program at work? Am I going to work on asking my boss for a raise? Or how do I negotiate this salary for the first time in my career? These little decisions, maybe they seem big. Maybe you've never made a financial plan before or a budget before. So they do seem big at the time. But in the grand scheme of life, these little everyday decisions we make about our money make a huge long-term impact. Am I going to call my spouse about this purchase? Am I going to dream together as a fan? Are we going to dream together as a family? Am I going to pray and ask God, please bless me. Please help me serve others. These are little decisions when you think about it. Oh, it's just a $2.69 coffee. That is what a black coffee cost me at Starbucks the other day. But how many times are you going to make that little mindless decision? And then you get to the end of the month and you look at all you've spent on eating out and it's $2,000 and you think, who stole my debit card? Who stole my credit card? These little decisions we make every day will make the difference. And our lady with the distaff, our Proverbs 31 woman, this is not about literally making thread. It is about having the intentionality to take one thing and by diligent, intentional decision-making, focus, foresight, turn it into another thing. Has that been helpful? I really hope it is. Here's an example of how we do not see this intentionality in daily life every single day. I read these articles all the time. And here's the headline of an article I recently read. Quote, paycheck to paycheck nation. Why even Americans with higher income struggle with bills. Listen to this and see if you can spot for me the problem. A house, two cars, a kid in college, Debbie and Nick Lemur all had the markers of a middle-class life. But they both remember one purchase, Nick's $600 bass amplifier, that prompted one of the biggest fights in their four decades of marriage. Quote, he didn't tell me. He hid it in the trunk of the car. And I found it, Debbie says, laughing. 14 years later, to me it was like, oh my God, how much is this going to screw our budget? End quote. The article goes on immediately to say, an unexpected bill like this is what separates millions of Americans from financial disaster. While people with the lowest incomes face the biggest challenges, even some households making above $200,000 are straining to pay basic expenses. Did you hear that? Did you hear what I just heard? A $600 base amplifier 
is the kind of unexpected expense Americans face that make them paycheck to paycheck? That's not an unexpected bill. He chose to buy a $600 thing that is not a need and hide it from his wife. Okay, wait, stop. This is not the same thing as getting a medical bill in the mail. This is not the same thing as your lights being more expensive than this month and last. This is just swiping, wanting it now, not having it in the plan, and not being on the same page with your spouse. I think that is a lot more telling than just saying, well, people with even $200,000 are struggling to make ends meet. We shouldn't have to live paycheck to paycheck. And I agree. That is no way to live. It's very stressful. But let's look at another example they provide in the same article. Another person they feature is, is a woman named Roby. And Roby was a was learning to go to massage school. She moves from Houston to Austin, spends all her savings to go to school. And then the pandemic hits and she goes on unemployment. She says, it's like an up and down on a roller coaster. She spent virtually all her savings between classes. She worked at a salon. Go girl, that's awesome. But she owes student loan debt. She kept it in forbearance. And she said, I didn't know what to do with myself. When you start making more money, you can upgrade your bills just a little bit. I got a new phone. I was like, this is a whole new world for me. Still living more comfortably, paycheck to paycheck. Bing! She hit it right on the head. This is what the average, typical American family does. They spend everything they make, and if they earn more, they spend more. And then if they earn more, they spend more. And if they earn more, they spend more, which is why you do hear stories like Americans making $200,000 can't afford their bills. It's because they are choosing to raise their bills. Why do I think that? One of the paragraphs in this article says exactly why I think that. Quote, bills are a prominent expense for the two. Rent and utilities are pricey in places like Austin. Okay, I understand Austin is a more expensive, uh, more expensive town. Let's move on to the next paragraph and read what are all the difficult Austin-based expenses they can't help but pay? Quote, a new floppy-eared responsibility entered their life. A long-coat Dalmatian puppy named Libby, both the keeper of household sanity and agent of <laughs> adorable chaos. Homebound life also called for splurges at GameStop, Nintendo, and Google for video games and streaming. Andrew paid off a TV he'd been financing and began a new plan for a bicycle that gets him out of the house. They're unemployed. They're living on unemployment, as the article says. But they get a puppy and they invite more bills into the house. When you hear articles or radio shows or TV shows or news channels in any way say, life is just too expensive. There, there's just no way to get ahead. I encourage you to just listen behind it a couple more clicks, because if you do, you'll see the choices that we make are the reasons we are in the places we are today. I understand emergencies happen. Yes, colossal medical bills happen when you can't predict they're gonna happen. Layoffs do happen. I am not discounting any of those real emergencies. But a $600 base amplifier that you hide from your spouse, getting a puppy that is going to be a large, large dog food eating animal when you are unemployed, getting subscriptions and financing a bike when you're on unemployment. These are choices I would push back on. I would say 
There's a difference between having the right to do something and having the responsibility to do something. We have to ask ourselves, is this my right or is this my responsibility? And yeah, you have the right to get a puppy whenever you want, get a puppy. But is it the responsible thing to do when you're unemployed, when you're in the middle of a move? The choices you make are the absolute difference maker in our lives. When we decided we'd had it, we were done feeling so stressed about only having $7 in our bank account. That flipped a switch for us. We decided our kids were not going to have to pay the burden for us for the rest of their lives. It flipped a switch for us. So we had to make those tough calls. And if you are doing that, if you're in the middle of baby step two, that's where you pay off all your debt using the debt snowball method, everything except for the house. Man, this is hard and you make hard decisions every single day. How can I earn more? How can I save more? How can I pay off more? Those are hard choices to make and I applaud you for that. But when you take the time, when you use the intentionality and focus to actually make these choices, it will pay off in spades in the long run. So I encourage you, don't shortchange yourself. Don't feel like you just have to get a subscription because you have homebound life. You always have a choice. You always have a choice. I just want to encourage you to remember that when you read stuff or you're having conversations, you always have a choice. And the tribe question for this episode goes back to baby step one. I am having trouble figuring out how to get a thousand dollars for my baby step one. Do you have any tips? Yes, I do. And congratulations on starting the baby steps. The baby steps again are seven simple steps that you can take from wherever you are to get to broke as a joke or just not having a plan to financial peace. They were developed by America's financial guru, Dave Ramsey, and they're what Dave and I have used to get out of debt and start actually working on our future instead of paying for our past. So baby step one is getting $1,000 in the bank. Now, some of you may have $1,000 just in your checking account. You just haven't accounted for it. That's the first place I would look. And if you have that already, go ahead and stick that in a separate savings account all by itself. Now, if you, like my question asker, my tribe has asked, how do I get this thousand dollars? The first place I would look is your income. You can probably ratchet down a lot of your spending and find a thousand dollars in your regular income this month or within this and the next month. On top of that, look around your house. What bookshelf are you not using that you could pop on Facebook marketplace? What games could you put on eBay. What about your talents? Are you a painter? Are you a graphic designer? Are you a carpenter? Can you serve somebody else by making something, creating something custom? Just ask your friends, hey, does anybody have any lawns that need to be mowed? Can I help anybody do their taxes or their family photo shoot? Whatever your talents are, somebody needs those. So you can really quickly ask around, find out where your skills are needed and help somebody. You'll be surprised, but once word gets out, your phone won't stop ringing. So start, start in those places. Look at your current income, cut back where you can, find things to sell. Dave Ramsey says, sell so much stuff the kids think they're next. Put the dog on eBay. Just kidding, Dalmatian, floppy ear Dalmatian. <laughs> there are a lot of ways to find $1,000. You can do it. Look around, sell some stuff, earn some more money. Now, I hope this was helpful for you. Again, if you need some help doing some coaching, getting your budget together, figuring out how to dream again with your spouse, I am here to help you. I am a financial coach and I have a couple spaces on my client roster. I would love to help you. Don't forget about that conference, the Smart and Frugal Moms Conference. I will link it in the show notes. And I have just one question for you. Ladies, what's going on with your money? Yeah.